am so excited to be talking with one of my idols in the entertainment industry, Mr. Jason Grah. I uh, have had such a uh, musical crush on this man for many years, and uh, we've met, and uh, this is the first time we get to sit down and chat uh, more intimately than we have ever been able to. So I want you all to uh, sit back and relax and learn a little bit more about uh, my friend Jason, and I hope you enjoy it. Thanks. There he is. Hello. Hello, darling. How are you? Keith, I, what are you doing here? Yeah, I, well, you know, I, I, I was going around your neighborhood, and I thought, oh, I'll just stop in and see what he's doing. <laughs> so, Can't believe it. I, I just happened to get out of the shower and put a fresh shirt on. Uh, I don't know why, but thank, that's, that's nice. I did, too, for, for, just for those who are watching. We, you know, it's a clean, it's, we'll start clean. Uh, <laughs> but that always goes south with us, doesn't it, darling? Yeah. So, uh, sweetie, I met you. I think the last time that we saw each other, like, in person, wasn't it like when you came to, no, I can't remember, it was probably in Palm Springs after a show. Oh, oh yeah, 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 it definitely was that. I think the last time was when you were here with Liz Calloway. I believe that's the last time I saw you here. Uh, so, um, I first met you, uh, Oh God! It, it must have been you were playing at Davenport's in Chicago. Oh my God! And uh, you were—I I, I believe my friend Karen Mason had mentioned how great you were, and this and that. And and I we, and my my husband Mark and I we had heard of you, and so we definitely got tickets. And and you were so sweet. Uh, we went downstairs to see you, and uh, we chatted for a while. And then really, uh, just you've been part of my musical life, as I said. Uh, in the intro, you'll see uh, just uh, one of my favorite people that I love. And you were so pleasant and sweet and, you know, so, you know, I fell in love with you. But uh, Acting. What, well, yeah, well, yeah, well, I'm sure it was the same pattern you gave Carol Cook. But anyway, I'm thinking that um, what really was uh, s striking to me and really stands out in my mind, because, you know, you changed the revolutionary world of CDs in 1997 when you appeared on your uh, CD, you're never fully dressed without a smile, or is it undressed without a smile? I'm not sure. I believe, that, I believe it was called dressed. You're never fully dressed without so what, a smile. What, what was the, uh, what was the uh, impetus <laughs> for the uh, cover? And Because I'll tell you, thank God Good it was- words. Oh, yeah, well, <laughs> the, um, thank God it was in a plastic cover is all I gotta say, because you know, <laughs> it was, it's, it's, it's always out. But uh, <laughs> that, it was a great, it's a great, it's a great photo. And, I'm, and while we're talking here, I'm hoping it'll pop up on the screen. People can see exactly what I'm talking about. But uh, what are you, uh, what was, what was the hell about? It was so fun. Well, you know, Bruce, it was Bruce Kimmel's uh, a total brainchild uh, for that album cover. He had been doing a, uh, a series, you know, like a spotlight series where he had Broadway people singing doing their solo albums and devoting it to a whole, the whole album to a composer. So, uh, you know, he had Judy Kuhn doing Julie Stein and Liz Calloway doing Frank Lesser and oh, yeah, Randy yeah. Graff. Randy Graff did Cy Coleman and Sally Mays did Comden and Green. It was a really great series. So I was the first uh, guy that he ventured uh, out in the world to try. And uh, so by the time that he got to me, so many of the composers had already been recorded. So there were like, my choices were Marvin Hamlish and Charles Strauss and Moose Charlotte. So I was like, I guess I'll take Charles Strauss. Yeah. <laughs> I love him so much. And uh, anyway, so we were starting to, you know, put together, Brad Ellis and I were putting together the songs and Charles was helping us. And, uh, and then we kind of had the song list and all that. And it was Bruce's idea. He said, you know, Jason, no one's going to know who the hell you are in bumfuck Kansas. So if you want to sell more albums, because we had a little piece of the album and stuff, you know, maybe what do you think about this idea? Dropping Trow and uh, calling it You're Never Fully Dressed Without a Smile. And I was like, sure, what the hell? Well, you were so young. I mean, you, you know. Yeah, well, I wasn't that young, but I, I was young compared to what I am now. So in that series, they came to you last, really? Well, they came to me first as far as being a guy, 
But uh, no, there were, you know, he continued that series for a while. There were many composers. I, still and I think I had all, I think I have all of them. I mean, it was, it was a great series. Yeah. Um, and uh, that was quite, that was quite a time, you know, he recorded so many yeah. uh, original cast albums and all those studio albums. And I think I did about 30 albums with him. Something crazy. You, how many, how many CD recordings are you on? You must have some idea. Oh God, I have no idea. 84. <laughs> Well, you know, I, and I've told you that I've told you this before. When I'm listening to my Pandora, only the one song comes up for Jason, and it's the uh, uh, I forgot the name of it already. Oh, I told you. Must have made a big impression. Well, no, no, it did because every time it's on, I'm I'm like I'm like glued to it. It was a a, a female composer you you had recorded for uh, one of her songs. Anyway, Adrian uh, Russ. No, but I'm gonna get it. I'll let you know. Uh, okay. Uh, Beautiful song. It, it's not the thing about, I'm going to run out of time. Am I archaic? No. No, but okay. you can sing anything, can't you? Uh, you know, I have. <laughs> well, that is the, I mean, you, you have such an extensive uh, cast album history. You are probably on more cast albums, you know, or, or recordings than anyone else uh, I can think of. Uh, I've done a lot. Yeah, you have. And are, are those fun to do? Oh my gosh. Yeah, some of them are. Some of them I'll play and I'll kind of frisbee them into the trash. If I just don't oh. like the way I sound or, you know, there are certain things that you just connect with. And um, I've had some incredible times, you know, but you know, when you're singing with a full orchestra, like I got to do Strike Up the Band, like we did both versions of Strike Up the Band with John Malcherry conducting. And, you know, you can't like be like Barbara Streisand and go, oh, please choose that take and this take and pick that note that was so good and that note you know so you're kind of at the mercy of uh the producer and the conductor and you hope that you know you did okay and uh so it it's, can be a mixed bag but i i'm so proud to have been on some of those probably my favorite uh was with john mcglynn we did a week of concerts of they we did a whole series of jerome kern shows and concert um they were the princess theater shows back in the 20s lady be good and sitting pretty and oh boy and leave it to jane all those old jerome kern pg woodhouse yeah. musicals and they were so good and so it was the 100th anniversary in the 80s 90s something like that and they did a lot of these in concert uh evans hale did at town hall and and um and uh, john mcglynn at carnegie recital hall and then we recorded some of them and uh sitting pretty i did with um Davis Gaines and Paige O'Hara and oh, Judy yeah. Blazer and Kim Criswell. Those, that's probably my favorite of them all. You know, a, a whole score that you don't know one song from and every single song is a gem. It's, it's, I think it's great. You're always in the mix for those. I mean, are, is it the producers who just know that you're so good that you can be brought in to do something like that? I just always felt like I, you know, was born in the wrong era and well, I always had an affinity for the, that kind of music and so especially when I was in the when I, in the 80s and 90s when I was in my 20s and 30s you know I was that come on guys let's put on a show yeah. and so uh, I just related to the the rhythm of the dialogue and all the songs just sat right in my comfort zone and well, so I, I got asked to do a lot of those things you're you're very good at it obviously and uh, very good Eddie you're very good, Eddie. Oh, okay. That was a musical. Uh, back in the... <laughs> that was an Eddie Cantor musical. Before John McGlynn died, he was going to record that uh, with the London Sinfonetta, and I was going to uh, play Eddie. They were going to do that. This was like in 2002 we were going to do it. No one but, picked um, it up? No one picked it up where it was and said, let's continue? No, unfortunately, he passed, and... Um, that that was like, yeah, we recorded right before he died. We a bunch of us went to London and recorded all those old shows that we had done at Town Hall and Carnegie Recital Hall, and uh, they they haven't been produced. Ugh. And we all went there: Rebecca Luker and Judy Kay and George Dvorsky and and Howard McGillan and Ron Rains and Alex Corey and uh, Kim Criswell, and we recorded everything and all these albums are just sitting there unproduced oh 
I know it's killing me. It's killing all of us. They'll get Maybe someday they'll get them. Maybe someday. Someday, you know, in the vaults, you know, that'll happen. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, there are just so many things I'd love to talk to you about, and I'm going to. So, uh, pardon, <laughs> if it, pardon me if it seems like it's all over the place. Uh, I want to first of all, first of all, especially mention Forever Plaid. Uh, one of my favorite shows to listen to. I've been able to do it, and I got to play the same role you did. So you are <laughs> definitely, uh, you are my mentor in that one. Uh, Where did you play Sparky? We did it in, it, we did it in a uh, community theater out in the suburbs of Chicago, and my husband was in it as well. And uh, What he played? Was he Francis? Yes. He looks yes. like, a, he seems like a Francis. Yeah, of course he is. Uh, it, it, it was so much, well, it was so much fun. I, for, for me, that was, you know, the music is so great to begin with, period. And then, you know, you uh, and, and your cast uh, obviously were great and it, 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 it took off and it played forever for you, right? How long were you doing that show? Well, uh, I did it uh, first in Teaneck, New Jersey when it was a two act show, it was like a play with a completely different conceit. Uh, it was about a reunion. It was about this four guy singing group that was just having a reunion in Smudge's basement. And I think Smudge was injured. We all had like injuries. We were like <laughs> older people coming back. It was very strange. I mean, you know, there's something wrong with every one of the plaids, but uh, in this version, we were handicapped. I don't remember what was wrong, but, uh, and then we just kind of sat around talking about it and then recreating the songs that we used to do. That didn't go really well. And the reviews were tepid to say the least. Then, then when we moved to, we workshopped it off Broadway and then, Stuart originally had had the idea of these four guys who had been killed on the way to their first big gig. And due to the hole in the ozone layer, they got to come back to Earth to do this concert they never got to do in life. So he told me that whole premise, and I thought, that sounds so ridiculous. Sign me up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was so ridiculous. Yeah, it, it, um, the premise is weird. Uh, to begin with, but the music is, you know, people forgive whatever, however you get into it, they don't care. They just want to hear the music. That's how I felt. So. Yeah. Uh, well, that's what was so genius about the show because the music always landed. The music was stunning. The arrangements by James Ray were spectacular and the musicianship was great. Um, you know, people would come, kids would come and they would think it was a great, hilarious lampoon of these 50s, 60s singing groups. And so yeah. it played very, uh, high camp and hilarious. Older people would come and think it was a very affectionate tribute to these guys. So everybody saw it in a different way and, and it, it was a phenomenon. It really was amazing. I was so proud to be in it. So I did the, the New Jersey company and then I did the workshop um, and then I stayed in it for uh, about a year and then I left. And, uh, and then everybody else stayed with it for like 15 years. <laughs> Were you the only one that defected for that long? I defected. I defected. I got a job. I got funny thing happened on the way to the forum at the York Theater Company. And, uh, and so I left to go do that. And then I just went in a different direction. And they all made a lot more money than I did. But, um, you know, they went to London and they came to L.A. to do it. And, uh, uh, and they, they went ask, to... Did they ask you to join at any of, at any of those? Mm -hmm. Oh, they did. Oh, yeah. That's nice. At that point, I was doing other things. But uh, yeah. I directed a couple of productions. Uh, in uh, Tulsa, my home, my second hometown, and then uh, outside New Orleans, I directed it. Well, and that was uh, when was what? When was that? When did that start? Oh my God! We opened in 1990. I left in 1991. Okay, so now we're doing. Thanks to the Rubicon Theater and Carolyn Burns, they're, they're doing a concert series at the Ventura Fairgrounds. And they've had Jersey Boys in concert, and uh, they've got Terry Bibb and Davis Gaines, and somebody else are doing a, a concert. Andrew Samansky uh, did a concert, through, and each of us are doing three nights. It's a socially distant, um, very little staging. We're doing kind of a concert version of Forever Plaid with other songs that made their way into the show. And oh my God. So David Engel, who I did it with originally, and Larry Rabin, who replaced me, okay. and uh, Leo Debelehu. <laughs> I loved Leo Debelehu. And uh, he uh, is flying in from New York. And uh, so anyway, we are starting rehearsals tomorrow. And uh, we're doing. 
three shows next week, next Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And so this is like 30 years, so it's a 30 year reunion, do we, is that what we're saying? It's been 30 years since Trevor uh, Platt opened. Wow. And yeah. Can't that's that. exciting. I mean, uh, that, that's gotta be so exciting for you. I mean, to, re, to rejoin that whole family and then actually to be performing again for, I mean, you've been off probably for a little while. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> He's a little rusty. <laughs> Well, I'm sure you have ways to grease that up and get it back going. I mean, you're, not, you're, not that, you're not that old, my friend. Um, that's going to be very exciting. Are they going to record that, do you think? Or? Oh, God, I hope not. Oh. Um, no, I mean, you know, I, it is so fun. And I got to tell you, it's, I have not done the show since 1991 when I left. And um, the harmonies are still there. They're still there they're so ingrained but uh unfortunately uh, um francis played by guy stroman lives in new york and it just was too much for him to fly out on a plane and you know do all that stuff to come out here so he's not doing it so larry raven and i um being that we both played sparky we're splitting francis duties and if you remember francis is the second tenor yeah sparky's the baritone which was high even the baritone stuff is high but francis is like so I am like, we will have these moments to remember. It's high shit. It, well, they're not, gonna lower it. they're not going to lower it for you, are they? I got them to lower one. Oh. Matter of fact. Yes, I did. Oh, wow. I, had, I threw myself at the mercy of the plaids. I said, if you want to see, if you don't want to see blood, Coming up, if you don't want to see like a hemorrhage happening, like you've got to bring this down a step, which they are. Well, that's great. I mean, it, it, it'll please the audience as well to not see you hemorrhage that way. It, uh, so that's how you, you've got, a, <laughs> you got a week to go. Is that right? Is it next weekend? Uh, we open uh, Monday, <laughs> uh, next, this, this coming Monday and then close on Wednesday. And everybody, so we're socially distanced. Our mics will be six to eight feet apart. And everybody will be in their cars. It's like a drive-in theater. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they're, they're doing a little bit of that out here in Palm Springs. They're trying that. They are? Yeah, yeah. Over by the, uh, the old Camelot Theater. Uh, you know, you've uh, been there before. Yeah. Yeah, you did a benefit there. for. Uh, and so they're, they're trying that. they got a drive-in thing going on. And I've heard that they have some potential. They want to do some kind of like little mini cabaret concerts or something might, might be popping up there, which would be great. great. You know, it's great. So that, you know, that's the, that's the, the wave we are, we're in right now. So I love to know that I could go and see the, see you at the drive. -in. That would be fun. <laughs> and it, it's also kind of perfect for forever plan a drive in, you know, it's oh, so oh, 50, 60s. It is. So it kind of fits really, really well. So are you just, you're just singing the songs. You're not going to do the bits. You're not going to be spinning. Plays. We're going to do some bits. We can't do a lot. Uh, just given, you know, the, the staging limitations, but um, it's all going to be seen on the screen and there's a camera that kind of catches us at different times. But uh, Stuart Ross has kind of, has written a new script that's specific to this venue. Uh, yeah. And we're actually playing us singing the songs of Forever Plant. So it's not like we're coming out as smudge, sparky, smudge, sparky, sparky jinx. So uh, yeah, it should be fun. So I'm, I'm excited about it. It um, it's a great show. I wish you so much luck with it, and really, I, I wish I could hear it. And, uh, I, if it wasn't so darn far, I don't even know where you're at. Where is that? Uh, Ventura? Wait, is that what you said? Ventura. Yeah, 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 yeah. How far is that from Palm Springs? I have no idea. It's an hour from me. Oh, then you know, it's it, it's probably just around the block for me. So maybe I will be there. Who knows? <laughs> uh, but that, that that's that's so great. And um, so you just finished uh, this last year. Uh, you were in Wicked for a long time, yes? Yep. Did you love that? Yeah, it was a year and a half. I uh, did. I did. How much it's, stage time do you actually have in that show? Somebody clocked it at uh, 24 minutes. Oh. <laughs> I love it. I know we would chat. You would uh, Sometimes when we were chatting, you're just like, ah, you're just waiting for... Your last, your last entrance, or something like that. And so, what did you do during all that time that you're off stage? What do you do? I can't really talk about it. Okay, that's great. So then, so then, what you were doing is exactly <laughs> what I thought. Okay. That's <laughs> do you know? Okay, so I had to show up at half hour, and then at once half hour, once places hit, you go. We do a little ritual over on stage right, and then 
at, at right at the top of the show, the whole cast that kind of gets together. And then I had an hour and 15 minutes till my entrance. So Ugh. I did a lot of stuff. I read, I talked with my castmates, talked on the phone. Uh, you know, I did a lot of stuff. I got a lot of stuff done. And I'm telling you, I got nervous every single night for a year and a half. People get so excited for that show. I felt like every single night was opening night because the audience is insane. And I've been in some hit shows. Forever Plaid was a hit show. That was like my first big hit show, which was so fun to be in something that people just adore so much. Um, and you know, I did Ragtime in LA for a year, but we had, we were premiering Ragtime. So it was a hit, but you know, it took a while to, gain steam and all this stuff but wicked people make plans to go see wicked a year in advance and you know it's a huge night out and it's an expensive night out and so it's a major event in all these people's lives and um i just got so excited their their energy was so off the walls that i every night i was like okay i gotta i'm the wizard of oz here i gotta deliver and boy you you must have now you were already done before all this happened, is that right? Did this were you? Yes, I le I my I left in uh, October, first of October. Okay. After a year and a half uh, in Las Vegas was my last city. Did you get to do Broadway at all? Did you do any of the Broadway run? Uh, no, because Broadway closed like two months later or four months oh, later, something okay. <laughs> like that. Maybe someday in the future, I don't know. You would be open for that, right? Let me check my calendar. <laughs> yes, I seem to have a blank slate. Well, that's good to know that you're available. Uh, for, so available. For work. Uh, Am I too available? Am I too needy? No, God, no. God, no. Have you seen people out there? No, you, you're fine. <laughs> the, um, one of the other great things I, I, I really adore about you is your musicianship. Your whole family, I believe, was in music. Am I correct? In some way, shape, or form? Yeah, and you're a French horn player. I, I am a horn player, and I still play now. Uh, you know, uh, well, not at the moment because we're all off. But I mean, where do I, you play? I, I, it, it, in Palm Springs, we have a, a, a band out here. It's a it's a community band, and uh, it's called Desert Winds Freedom Band. And, like and it, I've just been so I've been blessed to be able to continue to play under great director. And uh, but now all this happened, so. But you know, you always, uh, when I've seen you perform, and I think every time I've seen you perform, do you always play your oboe, always? You know, I try to, I put my oboe aside for a very long time. And, uh, and then I had to play it in a couple shows uh, that I did uh, in Godspell. I had to pull it out and play it for all good gifts and all that. And I really liked having it. I was a complete oboe nerd. And Calloway calls me an oboe sexual. Well, you definitely are that. It will, and it's, you're, I feel so. I feel that I am. How how often do you play? Do you, do you just pick it up and play? Was that a major of yours? Yes, I was. Uh, I was a, such an oboe nerd growing up in Tulsa, and uh, you know, I won the Tulsa Philharmonic Young Artist Competition. I played the Mozart Oboe Concerto Finale with the symphony, and um, yeah, I played a lot. I played everywhere, and then I went to I went to SMU in Dallas. This is a Kind of a funny little story. Uh, and I studied with this teacher, Devere Moore, not to name names. And I hated the way he played. Uh, he played, you, you'd hear his adenoids like, that made this horrible noise. He turned beet red. He was third chair in the Dallas Symphony. I was like, I get the third chair oboist in the Dallas Symphony? Like, what the hell? And anyway, so, and he, he insisted that I make reads, which all oboe players have to do. I had managed to get out of making reads all through junior high and high school because I was very busy in the plays and um, somehow I managed to like get around that. So Devere Moore was like, sorry kid, you gotta make these reads. And it's such a bore. I, it's really the reads that did me in. It's horrible. And so anyway, so I quit and I, I, I ended up transferring to Cincinnati Conservatory of Music. And I got accepted as an oboe major there and as also a, a musical theater major. And Devere Moore transferred to Cincinnati Conservatory the year that I did. Ah. Uh, well. Screw the middle classes. <laughs> I will never accept them. 
<laughs> Can you stand it? That's so. You've been able though to you you've thrown it into your act uh, beautifully, uh, and I, you know I I think people who maybe do not know that are kind of like, is he kidding me with this or whatever? It's beautiful. It's beautiful, and I uh, I've seen you do it in a couple of of shows, and that's I think that it's great that you continue to do that. Do you miss playing with like orchestras or anything like that? I do. I sing with so many orchestras and I usually, now I do this Jerry Herman concert uh, with Ron Raines, Debbie Gravett, Clea Blackhurst, Scott Coulter. And I, I play my oboe uh, with them. I do a song called You I Like from the Grand Tour that Jerry Herman wrote. And uh, so I, I play it. I tune the orchestra. I do this whole shtick. It's, it's so cheesy. But you know, I feel like, God, my parents threw will waste so much money on my oboe lessons and on my oboe major. And so I feel like it's the least I could do it's, is to whip my oboe out it's a, from time to time. <laughs> nice. It's a, it's, I think, to, again, I, I really look at someone who has played an instrument from youth and you're still doing it today. Even if it, it, it pleases you, it's pleasing the audience. And it's a different side of, you know, I don't, I don't see a lot of other actors out there playing their instrument. <laughs> Unless Penny Lapone counts, did she play a tuba or something once? I don't know what it was. She played the tuba in uh, Sweeney yeah. Con. God bless her, you know. Uh, That's right. I, yeah, you know, and they've tried to get me to come in and audition for a couple of those shows where everybody plays the, yeah. you know, the instruments. And I don't know. I mean, I don't love playing it. I want to just play it once and then be done with it. I don't want to have to play for other people. Yeah, you, you just kind of, you like to make your mark and then just drop the mic right there. You're off. Get out. Um, <laughs> So you they say also, though, you know, you know this, French horn players and oboe players all get a little nutty, you know, by the time they hit like 70 because of those tiny little openings that they're blowing their brains out in, you know, so there's such compression. It, uh, I got to keep this working if I want it to sound really good. And it, uh, you know, since we've been off for a while, so, you know, I just got to go around buzzing the mouthpiece in case we we do something somewhere, which I hope we will at some point. Maybe these guys. Keith, you gotta, you gotta keep that embouchure alive. I'm gonna try. Flutter tonguing is always fun. Uh, <laughs> you, uh, hey, you are the Lucky Charms guy, right? Was. Well, when it first started back in what, 1980-ish? Well, when it first started, it was like 1960-something, but thanks. And then it was the same guy. <laughs> it was the same guy that did it forever. Oh, I have a big box of cereal here, but you can't remember. There it is. There he is. That's wonderful. Living in the past. Yeah. Uh, Are you still anyway, so It was the same guy that had done it for 30 years that I grew up eating Lucky Charms. And, uh, and then... He finally sounded like he just couldn't get it up one day. <laughs> and, <laughs> Enter Jason. <laughs> Enter Jason. Enter Jason. So I auditioned and we had to, you know, we had to sound like this guy. And um, I hadn't been watching a lot of Saturday morning cartoons at that time of my life. Well, I was just getting home Saturday mornings <laughs> in the 90s. But uh Anyway, so, uh, yeah, it was a great gig. And I, I got it in New York, and then I moved out to L.A. to do Forbidden Hollywood, and they would uh, uh, get me a studio out here, and I would record my stuff here, and the kids would be in New York, and the General Mills people would be in New York. Then they fired everybody from General Mills. They fired everybody, and they wanted me to relocate to New York so that I was going to be there uh, at their beck and call, and I couldn't. I was doing a series, so I had to let the... I had to let the serial go in, in in favor of the series which then flopped and that was too bad <laughs> can you still do it can you do the voice <laughs> um then me it's magical marshmallow shape it's magically delicious are you still getting residuals nope oops another one dries up nothing for you well now they have a new guy so I don't you know. eat that stuff anyway. So that, you know. I, I always felt the marshmallows were peculiar. I didn't buy them. I didn't enjoy Ex them. I didn't enjoy them. They were very sweet. But if, you know, if, 
if I would have, if I would have known back then that was you, I would have bought it every day. (laughs) It was a great gig. I had like, I worked like, I don't know, six days a year. I introduced the pot of gold, uh, marshmallow shape and the rainbow shape. I think the balloon and something else, but, um, yeah, it was a great gig. Well, that's awesome. I'm, uh, I'm going to ask you, uh, now, uh, you have worked with so many great people, and I'd love to hear your impression of uh, these people as I, as I uh, mention them to you, uh, people you've probably worked with or you have, and, and what's your impression of them. Or if you have a funny story, you might want to share on some of them. Uh, <laughs> but um, it, it, you actually appear with, uh, you do concerts with a lot of people sometimes, too. You know, it's you and them, and I've seen that, and that part's great. Uh, do you enjoy singing with someone? Do you like sharing that bill all the time? Yes. Okay, you do. It kind of. I do. I get lonely by myself. Yeah. I mean, I've got great musical directors, and I adore being with them. Alex Rybeck is such yeah. a dreamy, hilarious, giving, fun guy to be with, and I love. He's a great guy to travel with, and and John Boswell as well. I mean, yeah. just just oh. that, and, and Jerry Sternbach. I mean, it's an embarrassment of of brilliant riches. I love working with all of them, but standing on stage alone. I mean, I'm with them. But um, I really love have some having somebody to bounce off of. What? Uh, so t- talk to me a little bit about Liz Calloway. I just I love her. I love I loved your show together with her. Plus, how's Liz to work with? What are your thoughts on Liz? You liked her. I love her. Huh. Uh, wow, I've never heard that before. Um, I can't believe it. Um, she's the best. We went to college together. We met in college. You and then we God, made our own. You did mm-hmm. Godspell. You did Godspell together. Uh, in New York, we made our off-Broadway debuts doing Godspell. That was oh. my first show in New York, and Liz's also. Oh. So after college, Liz dropped out after a year, and then and then uh, came to New York right away. Got her equity card, and then I followed. Even though I'm older than she is, she'll say. <laughs> and uh, then like, I was like two months. Uh, after I moved to New York, we got Godspell at Equity Library Theater. Uh, so that was amazing. I love her. We've been friends forever. Um, and she's, you know, her musicianship is impeccable. And we have such a great time on stage. We have a great camaraderie. And then, isn't it so great to go? And now, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> here's Liz Calloway. I'm going to go back to the dressing room and yeah. just sit on my ass. Yeah, yeah, uh, you know, no, it's perfect. It's great sharing it, and I, audiences like that too. I, you know, sometimes I would, you know, I don't know, seeing one person, you know, it's like give them a break, let something else. And then you do some duets, that kind of stuff's great. Liz is great. I, what I love about Liz Calloway, when when I see her, and I've seen her a lot, uh, is she's consistent. She is just consistent. I could, I could say she's singing it just like she was in the recording of I heard whatever she's. She's. I I just love it, and, and it's a pure sound that I love. And so she's taken. She's taken impeccable care of her voice. Oh, God bless her. I mean, seriously. Uh, so I'm assuming that in uh, Godspell, you played Jeffrey because you played that? No, and oh. I wanted to play Jeffrey. I played Herb. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. Herb, 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 Herb. That's right. And then uh, who'd Liz do? Is she day by day? Robert? No, she was Bless the Lord My Soul. Oh, wow. Nice. It's a big deal. And uh, Herb got uh, three lines in uh, You Are the Light of the World, and then he got the reprise of Learn Your Lessons Well. Wah, wah. But, uh, but then he does, the whole, he does the whole prodigal son. The other thing was, was that Scott Bakula was Jesus. Wow. I know. It did was you, like, share well, a dress- that would be fun. Did you share a dressing room? We did. Nice. And, um, <laughs> You know, you're supposed to adore Jesus, but we all wanted to go to bed with him, so that was kind of weird. Well, whatever gets you through the night. Exactly. I believe he made me a believer. Tell me a little bit about, about your, your fun experience with the wonderful Faith Prince. I got to see you guys do that here at the Purple Room in Palm Springs just a few years ago. <laughs> and uh, Faith Prince uh, seems to be a, a big figure in your life, yes? She is also a huge figure in my life. I, lo- I love her. They're both like sisters. They're both like the sister that I have, but I would have rather had. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's how I, I, just, 
Have I said too much? No. There's nothing more I can think of to say to you. <laughs> You're going to do the um, score of Evita for me. For yes, else? I think we're on the way, okay. actually. Did uh, you, uh, you had both of them were integral in your, um, your wedding, am I correct? Well, Faith was the minister. Yeah. And uh, that was spectacular. Uh, she was just how fun. heartfelt. How fun. She, was, she was heartfelt. She was um, funny, of course, hilarious. Um, she was a great leader. She was like a real spiritual leader. Uh, I said, I'd go to your church after that was over. Uh-huh. She got that, you know, pass for the, the unity minister pass for a day, you know, so that you could marry somebody. Yeah. and that. So, uh, but boy, did she take on that role spectacularly. And Liz sang. See? So, uh, and so did Susan Graham. Oh, wow. A star. Wow. I know, it was, it was a who's who. But uh, Faith, we all went to college together at Cincinnati Conservatory. Oh. And so that's where I first met Faith. And Faith and I um, did several shows in New York together. And then we kind of lost touch for a while being on different coasts. And we were all, you know, going separate ways. Faith was busy winning Tony Awards and I was busy doing whatever it was I was doing. And um, anyway, then we, we, we hooked up at a, a benefit for 42nd Street Moon in San Francisco and um, a theater company. And it was a Jerry Herman benefit. And we had not spent time together and we just went. And this was like, I don't know, was it 15 years ago? And we just ignited. And we said, we gotta, we gotta do a show. This is like, we've got so much history. And we have been kind of inseparable ever since. Oh, that's awesome. I mean, it's awesome. Yeah, it. she's, oh, what a great talent too. Um, she's, she's absurd. Uh, she's fearless. She well, is fearless. She's brilliantly smart and she's fearless. You throw, she'll try anything. She'll throw it against the wall. And I love working that way. It's like, I, yeah, sure. Let's try it. If it gets a laugh, we keep it. If not, get rid of it. You guys have such chemistry together. It, it, was, it was brilliant to watch and so entertaining. I just didn't want that night to end. Um, what these is- girls, these girls have, uh, you know, helped me step way up in class. I'm pretty lucky. Well, speaking of class, what about Elaine Stritch? What has you been, what was your experience like with stretching? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I just wrote a story about her in my writing class. I'm taking a writing class right now, which is like getting me through this entire quarantine. And uh, we just had our 18th class i think and faith i got faith to take it and it's online and claudette sutherland who was the original smitty and how to succeed in business oh yeah. is, uh, she's teaching it wow. and she teaches like all these different levels and all that and uh so we have this fabulous class like i think there's seven of us in it and we read every week we write some so i wrote a little about elaine stretch because it was it was a complicated time with her. I, well, we met at Rainbow and Stars uh, when I did uh, this fantastic Rogers and Hart review. Uh, and the cast was Elaine Stritch and Margaret Whiting and Judy Kuhn and myself. Wow. We called it, I called it, Three Baritones and a Soprano. <laughs> 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 I had the second highest voice of the show. It was Judy Kuhn and me, and then Elaine, and then Margaret. But I mean, I thought, what a weirdo combination. And Fred Wells did the musical direction. He had just come off uh, being part of the Wise Guys, and his his arrangements were <laughs> stunning. Elaine was a lot. You know, she had her first director fired. Um, she was very nervous because this was her cabaret debut, and the Rainbow and Stars was a very high end room right next to the Rainbow Room on top of, you know, Rockefeller Plaza and uh, at the, the NBC building in Rockefeller Plaza. And um, she was she was really tough. And I, I wouldn't say I enjoyed rehearsing with her at all. I was terrified. But once we opened and got rave reviews, there was no better comrade, co-worker, supportive castmate as Elaine Stritch. She uh-huh. just, she laughed. She was generous. Uh, I was on her Christmas list. Uh, I would get her, her husband was Thomas Bays, uh, who had the English muffins. Oh, right, right. And so I would get a box of like 30 packages of Bays English muffins every Christmas, which was great. So we kept in touch for years and years and years. She was, she was great. She uh, was great. And she was also a master class. Like she would do, 
she sang 10 cents a dance like she was in an insane asylum and it was like oh my god i mean i it was so thrilling and her stories were so thrilling and uh when she sang zip you know from pal joey the thing uh the gypsy rose lee song she milked comedy out of there that was i don't think lorenz hart ever dreamt would be funny when he wrote it and she just telling you it was a master class it's awesome. I, it was a thrill. I could write probably a whole book. If they asked me, I could write a book about Elaine Strip. Gee, there you go. That's great. Uh, tell me also about Karen Morrow. <sighs> I, I grew up remembering watching her and Nancy Dussault on some show. And I just loved both of their voices. And I was, she just looks like she'd be so much fun. She is. And she is she's, one of my, she's one of my closest friends here in LA. We, oh. we did the, we, we met doing concerts in New York in the 80s and 90s and in DC. And uh, then thanks to the Jerry Herman show, Hello Jerry, that I toured with, that ASCAP produced and Jerry Herman traveled with us. That's where Karen and I got to work really closely. And we've kind of been inseparable ever since. She's just, she's, she's a great friend. She's a ridiculous talent. Yeah. Her voice just stayed gorgeous. It just got warmer and more beautiful. And she has so many stories and she's just rooted in reality. She's seen it all. She's been through it all. Yeah. And she's just very pragmatic about the business. Just I, very honest and very like, you know, no bullshit. Really growing up, I was like, wow. And then I would be looking for her here and there. She was on television and, and yeah. she some other things. And, but I've, I heard that name's always stuck with me. I've never been able to see her. Uh, I mean, I've never had an opportunity to see her perform, but boy, I sure would love to if she ever came out this way. Can I tell you, uh, if you haven't seen, I'm sure you have, Keith, but um, for anybody that's watching, to go, uh, to go to YouTube and just type in Karen Morrow, I had a ball, and see her sing on the Ed Sullivan Show. Have you seen that? No, but I, I, but I, I did just see that there was a clip of it on, on YouTube. I'm telling you, it's in my top five most watched YouTube videos. She is stunning. Well, I just, I just love her. And so, you, and so you're still close with her and- uh, Yeah. Isn't she good friends with like Joanne Worley and- All the broads and she and Nancy, I see Nancy do so oh, a lot too. Yeah. Uh, but Nancy moved out to the beach recently. So, um, and of course oh, COVID. Did. Oh yeah. Yeah, they, she and her husband have a, a beautiful place out there. But uh, well, I get to see her you know, from time to time. And um, I love the broads and Nancy's stories. Nancy's got so many stories. Karen's got so many stories. And Joanne, you know, uh, I, 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 I love would, her. I would love to have, I would have love to have lunch with all three of, well, four of you. Yes, you would. It would be great. You know, uh, Nancy Dussault, uh, she was, I went to, when I went to see Into the Woods on Broadway, she was doing The Witch at that Yes. Time. So yep. that was my uh, my exposure to my one of my one of my first Broadway shows to see, and she was spectacular, just yeah. spectacular. And you know, yeah. I, you know, and I grew up watching her too, and so it was yeah. that was that was always great. How about Jerry Herman? Were you able to uh, do a lot with him? Yeah, yeah. What was he like? Yeah, I got to know him. I got to know him really well. I got to uh, really be in his world, uh, traveling in Hello Jerry. Um, around the country. And then I've done so many incarnations of that show. It started with Karen, Paige O'Hara, Jerry and me, and then it morphed into Ron Raines and Debbie Gravitt and Karen Morrow and me. And then now we do the symphony gigs that, that Jerry put together uh, and they still continue. And what's great about Jerry, he's, you know, he has a scholarship and we do master classes in every city that we go to. And we hear the students, you know, from universities around there and, Whoever kind of went, you know, who's they feel that we feel is the strongest uh, in the class gets a check from the Jerry Herman Foundation. And then they get to perform with us in the symphony. They get to come up and sing a song. And Jerry, um, Jerry really wanted to pass his legacy down and to support young kids in musical theater and also to keep his name going because, you know, that's an, that's an old... That's an old name, Jerry Herman. And the kids these days, you know, they don't have a great memory. So it's good to like. It's, I think it's great that we're putting it back out there. People can go in and, and appreciate it. And, uh, yeah. Let me ask you about one more before we uh, wrap up. How about the wonderful Carol Cook? 
I just talked to her a week ago. Get out! I just talked to her. It was her husband Tom's uh, birthday, so we had them. They are so sweet. They are so yeah. sweet. They're the best. Yeah. They're the best. I'm telling you, all my old friends are, all my friends are like the high-risk COVID people. We can't <laughs> ever see each other. Because right. <laughs> right. right. High-risk. Oh. I call myself, I'm high-risk adjacent. <laughs> but um, Carol, Carol's doing great. She's, you know, she's doing incredibly. She's 96, and uh, she's smart as a whip. Her stories are every bit as vibrant. I know she misses, like, just talking to her on the phone, I realized, like, she needs an audience. She needs somebody to banter with. She needs, like, a place to get those jokes out, which I understand, because, you know, my husband's heard all my jokes, so he just rolls his eyes at me. Same here. My husband doesn't uh, laugh anymore. Oh, my God. Can I tell you, I am just, like... I am so I love doing the videos. I love the Zoom. But like in writing class, everybody pushes the mute button while we read our stories. So you can't hear any laughs while you're reading the stories. And some of my stories I find to be very hilarious. And you know, I have to look up to see if people are going. <laughs> it's pathetic. It's like an actor's nightmare. You like put it and like all the videos and doing a lot of benefits for theaters. I love doing them. I love putting them together. It gives me something to live for. But it's like you just do them. There's no response. It's like the actor's nightmare. It's like getting out there and going and having nothing. Silence. Right, right. I cannot wait yeah. to hear an audience uh -huh. laugh. Just, just to have that energy, you know? Yeah. You, you discover so much. You discover so much when you're standing on stage and the audience informs you what's funny. And then you go, that works. So maybe I'll try that. And, you know, I mean, that's, that's how we live, you yeah. know? And, well, you're so good at it. Thank you so much for spending some time with me and the people who will be watching this. Uh, to get Keith, to I loved it. It was so good to see you. Thank you. Oh, it's really good to see you. And I hope we could do it again sometime. You know, there's, I'm sure you have more stories and I would love to, to sit in here. I wish you well on the uh, reunion uh, concert you'll be doing. And Thank you. I, I hope to see pictures or something of it. I hope someone, uh, you're not going to be wearing those masks, are you? I have a feeling we're going to enter in masks. Ah. I have a feeling we're gonna enter in masks, but I think they'll be plaid. Mm. Will you have candles? Are you guys coming in as a? Maybe, I don't know, we start tomorrow. I, you know, I'm just trying to get my harmonies down. So, you know, tomorrow we're gonna to do the staging and all that stuff, so uh, I'll let you know. Audiences will forgive you anything. <laughs> They're just gonna be so happy to see you guys up there. I mean, good Lord. Uh, that'll be it'll be it'll be fun i'm I'm really proud of the Rubicon theater for organizing this well, best of luck on that and thank you so much for all the years of of entertainment and the, and those that are going to be coming from you because you are one of the greatest that are out there and I'm so glad and I hope anyone who hasn't ever met Jason before has is going to enjoy this and and want to go hear all the stuff that he does thanks again Keith, thank you I miss Palm Springs man I really miss well, you guys when we're able to have you back here because right now it's you know <laughs> But, uh, I won't be had. But uh, it, it, thank you for doing this and for um, continuing to entertain because without that, what are people looking at and listening to at this point? This is what's keeping us all alive. So thanks, thanks. for doing what you do, honey, and I will chat with you later. Thanks, everyone. Stay Bye -bye. safe. Bye, y'all.